examination of effusive volcanic eruptions and the rocks and textures that they produce. We're now into Roman numeral 5 of this lecture as we move away from basalts into silicic lavas. The form of silicic lavas is controlled by its viscosity, and because they're higher silica, they are higher viscosity, and the form is different. Here's a great example of a lava dome of more silicic, higher viscosity lava that doesn't have a chance to flow smoothly away from the vent. Instead, it piles up over the crater in a thick, high aspect ratio lava dome. As we go through silicic lavas, just a reminder, this was pages 241 to 279 in our textbook. The rock names associated with silicic lavas are things like rhyolite and dacite, andesite, uh, trachyte. These are the type of rocks that you'll be seeing in lab or out in the field that are silicic lavas. They tend, we're going to just put a tendency here, they tend to be high viscosity. And as such, they tend to have a high aspect ratio because their thicknesses could be anywhere from like, let's say, oh, you can't see that too good. Here we go. Our thickness here could be anywhere from 50 meters to maybe 500 meters thick. These are thick things. And their travel distance, here's like the vent, let's say where well, the vent would actually be down here, right? But the travel distance is in this case, very similar to the actual thickness. So they have a high aspect ratio. Thickness is 50 to 500, if you want to write that down. Just as a rule of thumb, that would be fine with me. The forms that they tend to make are lava domes. And we'll start with lava dome. Here's a picture of a lava dome. We should add another picture of a lava dome, shouldn't we? Yeah, let's do that. Here's, a, here's another picture of a lava dome. This is an actively erupting lava dome, I believe in Indonesia, where here is a lava dome in California that erupted about 700 years ago at a place called Mono Craters. And we see this thick-sided lava dome. The crater was a small fissure here that it erupted from, um, and it kind of fills this explosive crater that formed before the lava oozed out. Okay, so these are really good pictures for your mind about what does a lava dome look like. In our notes, we're going to put a dome. This is probably the most common form for a silicic lava. And what that means, a dome means, it, it has short transport and it's kind of like a plug-like lava that sits above the vent plug like lava that sits or rests above vent. Maybe, like in this example, it's like in a crater. The crater blasted out first, and then when the eruption was coming to a, an explosive eruption was coming to a cease, an end, and, and a fusion occurs at the end. So sometimes we see it sitting in the crater. The actual material, if you look at this somewhat closely, you see there's this auto-brecciated carapace, kind of like ah-ah, uh -uh, formed of a bunch of blocks. And sometimes those blocks are smooth, sometimes they're angular. But what I'd love to do is try to draw this for you. Let's, let's finish our definition, then we'll make a drawing that sits in a vent. What ends up happening is that there's dense lava interior covered by auto brecciated brech let's see b r e c c i a t e d auto brecciated exterior and so to draw that let's just kind of draw this example here where we have a crater that's formed with some pyroclastic explosive eruptions and then here's like the conduit and then coming out of that conduit is dense lava and it has no opportunity to flow very far, just kind of oozes out and creates this like viscous plug. I'm drawing it kind of angular like this because it's flowing, but it doesn't have an ability to move really at all. And as soon as gravity takes its hold on this material that's sticking up so far out of gravitational equilibrium, it shatters and it starts to just break apart into this auto brecciated carapace that kind of covers the whole thing. So here in black, I'm going to, because this is like not dense lava anymore, it's broken stuff. 
this broken rubble just covers the whole thing. We call this material scree or talus. Um, lava blocks would be another good name for it. So this would be kind of a good sketch where we have the brecciated bit in black. And it's brushing and breaking apart, mostly just in response to gravity and then also strain in the lava as this high viscosity material is trying to move, but it can't really. And so it fractures and breaks apart. And then there are bits where there's like the actual dense lava that pokes its way through before it finally collapses. These are the things I'd want you to have in your picture. We can make the crater look a little better by adding some tephra stratigraphy, which we'll talk about later. Okay, that's a good sketch for your notes of a lava dome. The actual blocks themselves, so we have brecciated blocks. We're going to call that talus. We're going to call that scree. But most of the time we'll call them lava blocks. And they may be pumicious. They may be jagged. Uh, let's, let's say that. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, blocks. I ran out of space up there. The blocks, they may be smooth-sided. In some lavas they are. Sometimes they're jagged and really rough. Sometimes they're dense. Sometimes they're vesicular. There's just a really wide range in textures in the brecciated material on these lava domes. So dense or vesicular. Let me show you a couple more uh, neat pictures of the lava domes. I said sometimes dense plugs poke out through the carapace. Here's a really famous example of that. This is from a hundred years ago, where in the Caribbean there was a volcanic eruption, and you can see this loose, broken, auto brecciated bit, but then a dense plug of the lava, probably rhyolite, so high viscosity, poked through and created this spine that shot up hundreds of meters into the air. For scale, there's a person right down here. You can imagine how gravitationally unstable this is, and it eventually, after handful of days I believe just collapse down and the collapse of these um, spines that stick up is actually one of the greater volcanic hazards uh, for example let's just kind of show a picture here of another here's an example where a lava dome is oozing out of a volcano but when it gets too steep and it auto brushy it collapses to form these debris avalanches that if you were standing here would wipe you out or if a town was there would also be buried and people would die so the collapse of lava domes is actually a very high um, volcanic hazard and risk now i didn't write any of this stuff down but if you want to make a note about volcanic spines and gravitational instability and collapse causing volcanic hazard uh, that would be a good thing to do in my opinion now when there are slightly higher um, flow amounts oh how do we want to say that well, we're going to say silicic flows. So when you flow more than a dome, what do you call that? Well, you can call it a silicic lava flow. Sometimes we call these coolies. Oh boy, it's not two U's. That first one there is an O. A coolie is another name for a silicic lava flow. With these, they tend to be, they, they have a lower viscosity. And because they have a lower viscosity, um, they also have a lower aspect ratio. And they actually form a lava flow that's able to travel along the ground for a kilometer, two kilometers, three kilometers. Before we go into more, any more notes, let me just go ahead and show you one. This is a high silica rhyolite. It should be a very high viscosity lava. And the vent, this is in Oregon, by the way, the vent is right here. And the material diffused from that vent and poured, right, like molasses or nacho cheese, in this direction, in this direction. We can actually see how uh, these, these surface ridges are forming on the surface of the lava that kind of uh, indicate the emplacement in this direction, in this direction. So it tends to be lower viscosity. They form flows. They could also have a higher effusion rate. We tend to equate coolies with higher effusion rates. And what that means, an effusion rate is how fast the material comes out of the ground. In a lava dome, maybe it's coming up really slow, it's thick and sticky, it doesn't have a chance to really build up a lot of material, so it never flows. But a coolie would be the opposite. A lot of material is oozing out of the ground, giving you an opportunity to create an actual lava flow. Another th factor that we tend to see in coolies is an asymmetry. 
an asymmetry about the vent. Controlled by topography. A lava dome, here's the vent, there's our lava dome. It's symmetrical, it just sits up in a pile. But a coulee, depending on the topography, tends to have like, it's gonna flow downhill. And so you're gonna have it be closer to the vent in one place and the other side will travel much further. And those are our two different forms of silicic lavas. Now to wrap up lavas, we need to just talk a little bit about textures. So what I wanna do here is, is we're gonna, oh, let me, I have one more picture of a coulee. So what does the aspect ratio look like of one? Well, you can see it's a much lower aspect ratio. And this, the, the, the edge of a silicic lava flow or even a mafic one is called the flow front. And let me just zoom into a flow front of a coulee. This one is down in Chile. Here's a couple volcanologists for scale. And this lava flow, you can see this auto carapace, looks a lot like an ava, uh, uh, sorry, an ah uh, ah. Uh, and um, it's about 50 meters tall. And it's crumbling upon itself as, as it moves in this direction at around one meter per day. So that would be like the emplacement mechanism of a coulee as you picture what the flow front of something like this looks like. Okay, so then now, let, now let's move on to our last thing in the lava discussion of volcanic rocks, and that is textures. What textures should your eye be trained to recognize both in hand sample and thin section? In future field work or in lab work for your class? Well, we'll try to draw a couple sketches, but one thing you're going to look for is oriented uh, crystals. These can be phenocrysts or microlites. And when I say microlites, I mean ground mass. So, so both phenocrysts and ground mass microlites will, can be aligned in response to flow. Ground mass microlites. If here's our rock, we could have some phenocrysts of plagioclase, that have their long direction all lined up in the same way. And maybe even the microlites in the ground mass are aligned in that same way. And they're telling us that the lava is flowing in this direction. Another texture you can look for is the bubbles. And what we could see are rounded to elongate vesicles. Let's see, vesicles. Now, just because we see rounded to elongated vesicles doesn't necessarily mean it's a, it's a um, lava, but it is something that you'll see in hand sample. As you could see, bubbles that are kind of like squished out like this, and that's telling you that the lava is flowing. Or in a basalt, you actually might see rounded bubbles. So these are like an ore type texture. Now, if the let's do this. Here we go. Here's another bubble. If that bubble later gets filled by secondary mineralization, that's called an amygdule. And it's something definitely to look for in basaltic lavas in particular. So we'll define this. Amygdule is when a vesicle is filled by a secondary mineral. It was an open spot, but then something like calcite or a clay fills that open void. Another texture you should look for is glass. This is that battle between nucleation and growth, right? And if the melt is really high viscosity or if the cooling rate is very, very fast, you never, you don't have time to nucleate or grow. Another word for glass in these lavas is called obsidian. This is something to look for because we have very rapid, oh, I'm glitching out a little bit, very rapid cooling. relative to crystallization processes. Sorry, my pen is, uh, my, my computer's glitching a little bit. Crystallization processes. And then finally, the last thing I want you to look for is called flow banding. Let's see if I have a good picture of flow banding to put in. Yeah, this is good. 
So lava flows often have flow banding, which looks like stratigraphy, but it's not sedimentary at all. Instead, it's a volcanic texture that's produced by the flow of the lava. So we'll put here, this is D, this is the last thing in our notes. D is flow banding. And another way to say flow banding is that these are like stratigraphic laminations. Maybe we just say the word laminations. And they can be horizontal like they are in this picture, or they can be highly folded and contorted like they are in this picture. So these are laminations. They may be folded. Why would they be folded? Well, because the lava flow is a really high deformation environment. And so things are constantly being ripped up and torn and folded around, right? Kind of like a metamorphic rock in a lot of ways. Our flow banding forms in response to different things. We could just take heterogeneities and stretch them. So it may form from stretched heterogeneities. You can also form flow banding from aligning bubbles or crystals. Aligned bubbles or crystals. And then you can also find flow banding that forms in response to shear planes. And you would need to look more closely at the flow banding to identify if it's one, two, or three, or even combinations of those. If we were to just see a rock and make a quick sketch here for your notes, here's our rock, and it has a slightly folded flow banding inside of it, and you would see it as something that's uh, subtle or even very pronounced. You can see that in thin section, or you can see it in hand sample. It happens at a variety of different scales. All right, well, we're done with effusive eruptions. Next lecture will be the introduction to explosive eruptions.